Hello and welcome back to What's Your History? I'm your host Kelly Hunter and this podcast covers all areas of history and archaeology, no matter how big or how small, how well known or how niche. Today's guest was Helen Brazier and she shared with us about 18th century poaching ballads. She has a master's in 18th century studies. It was a very interesting topic. I do hope you enjoy it just as much as I did. Hello, Helen. Hello. <laughs> so, what is it about this particular subject that got you interested? I've always been really interested in uh, crime of the 18th century, uh, but all different types of it, because people often think, oh, that's literally just the criminal justice system. But so often it's not, because the criminal in question would have um, interacted with society in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. Um, So when you look at it through the ballads, um, they are just a way of seeing how the common person thought about them yeah. and that's usually starkly different from how the justice system or the victim <laughs> thought about them. Ah, so, I like that because in, in all fairness I studied archaeology because it was talking about the everyday person and this is kind of doing the same thing but for ballads. Yeah, exactly because of the way they were written it was often um, done as, as how they saw them which as I'll come on to as much more heroic and noble whereas in reality they were just you know, a quite violent criminal. Yes. <laughs> and obviously the justice system would, um, and they, they sort of go through the prosecutions and uh, punishments, that can be kind of a very dry representation of them because it was literally, yeah. you have committed this crime, you've come before the courts, this is your punishment, which yeah. could be up to death um, ah, on that yes. one. So I just get a little bit interesting, <laughs> you know, on that. So what um, sort of things would people have been killed for? Like if they were sent to prison, what, what how big are little was the crime have to be before they would go yeah that was the thing with the 18th century <laughs> system of uh, crime punishment it was very harsh you would think it would just be murder or perhaps treason but it was not it was um, a whole host of other as we, if you consider the famous um, high women Dick Turpin he was actually executed for horse stealing so you'd think uh-huh. it would be the murders or be you know robbing people but no it was horse theft that he got hanged for um, in the local area you know in, in your so, uh, yeah, so poaching, um, they didn't actually have to kill someone to potentially get the death sentence. Um, sometimes they would be held and, um, yeah, sort of punished or transported or, you know, lesser lesser sentences depending on what they'd done and what they had poached. Okay. If it was a rabbit or were you taking prime deer, you know, yeah. from an estate? If you did that, because you would have taken a lot of money as well yeah. from the person that was going to sell that, you oh. know, it could have been classed as more serious as you poached deer. So, well, do you... I know back later on um, in earlier history that deer suddenly became uh, the property of the king. Mm. Uh, was this still the case in the 18th century? Usually the landowner. Okay. It would have been the ones you would often find when I looked at the court documents around this, it was the landowner and the uh, gamekeeper that were brought to testify and it was them that were classed as a victim. Obviously it was only the gamekeeper that had maybe got on the wrong end of a, a gun or you know, whatever they'd armed themselves with um, to to go poaching but it was the landowner usually that it was kind of the poacher versus versus them you know it was them that had brought the trial the trial to oh cool is there any like famous people who may have been killed for this aside from Dick Turpin do you, do you is there any kind I mean, of famous people Dick Turpin was a was a high woman not a poacher yeah. uh, well I mean he was <laughs> you know when he was with um, the Gregory gang he, he did um, sort of get into poaching so I could have a look at him as well but whereas with the high women you would often know their names like 16 Stream Jack or Claude Duval or Dick Turpin yeah, or yeah. I could go on but I won't but um, <laughs> you'd know their names the poachers you didn't okay. and a lot of them even in the ballads they don't mention them by name they just call them the poachers or the bold poacher it's you have to go in and find the names and none particularly um sort of stood out as anyone famous maybe in the local area they might have had a reputation at the time but through you know the centuries it largely gets lost and it's their story yeah. rather than their name yeah. um I tried to link some of the ballads to see if it could link to actual court documents but what I found usually it was a mixture of several crimes perhaps that they'd committed rather than just this one offence they wrote oh. about it and then you know went on yeah. it was uh, so obviously I did get the names for uh, one of the chapters because obviously in the court documents that's where in which, the by chapters the way, she yeah. means doing uh, her dissertation oh, sorry yes <laughs> sorry listeners yes I mean the chapters in my dissertation where I did um one one chapter that, that did cover um 
sort of the law and, and it, it's uh, how that was handed down uh, and that's where a lot of the rather dry information is yeah. um, so then, and if anyone's interested from it's all on a microfilm which you can imagine <laughs> going through that um, where you might have goodness knows how many crimes brought before the court and you have to go through reams and reams of it to find one mention of a poacher on it so it was time consuming so you um, might just go one. into like a search bar and go poacher and it'll come up or all no sadly not it would say that you, sometimes you would see that it, it did involve of it, especially the quarter sessions mm. tended to t- say more uh, and the big ones kind of at Christmas and Easter would say more what they were going to try mm. whereas a lot of the times it would just be like various crimes tried and so you'd have to go on the actual film uh, the, the ones I looked at were held at uh, the North Allerton archives but mm. yeah that's the drier side of things the ballads is where it gets more interesting yeah. <laughs> in my opinion anyway that's perfectly fine and in regards to these ballads are kind of you said they were kind of turned into like heroes and stuff is it sort of mm. like the Robin Hood sort of feel sort of thing yeah I think it's it it looks very much of the poacher against the system uh, kind of thing, which would tie nicely into the Robin Hood thing of <laughs> yeah. taking from the rich, give to the poor. Um, but yeah, it's obviously a lot of the times it was focused from the poacher's point of view of what they would need, um, but they didn't seem to distinguish too much between kind of poaching to feed yourself and your family. Yeah. And poaching for profit, which yeah. is where the deer would have come into that, because you can link it directly to kind of uh, newspaper reports. If there's going to be a big venison sale or things yeah. like that, yeah. people would start poaching because they can go and sell it. But, uh, so why have you focused on the 18th century purchase and not like earlier or later versions of these things? Is there is like nothing there? Those, or is it just this period you're interested in? I mean, it is uh, sort of the, the long 18th century, as it were. That's what my master's in. We were actually allowed to study from like 1650 to 1850. So it's a long, <laughs> long time. Uh, or past into the 18th century. Obviously, with a master's dissertation, you have to kind of narrow it down. Um, and that was done by purely what I could find. Um, okay. So I did focus on kind of the mid, uh, the midpoint about sort of the 1780s uh, mostly because I found that's where the ballads um, were there was more of them okay. basically there's a lot more on high women but uh, the, the, the ones on the poachers yeah there was a there was a good sample enough for me to be able to write about yes <laughs> um, I might have already asked this question but why poachers are not high women that you're interested in yeah now that is probably going to disappoint you when I say this it's not some grand <laughs> like um, idea that I had done about high women for my undergrad dissertation I wanted to take it further but due to the Covid situation when I presented this to my supervisor most of the documents I would need are in London and when I was doing this it it was questionable whether I would be able to travel so he said um, would I consider doing poaching because a lot of documents are held in Yorkshire about okay. that there was very prolific in Yorkshire apparently <laughs> I mean you can see with the kind of rural you know, thing yeah. around it that it would have been fine so it was necessity but I soon found that it was very interesting and it was something that I was happy to write about and there are, are a lot of um, sort of similarities um, between it of kind of how they are represented and how people saw them and that idea that perhaps if you're a victim you know they're a terrible criminal and like yeah. however to the everyday man it's like this romantic poacher or romantic high woman <laughs> and it just makes it interesting yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh wonderful so sorry that's not the answer you wanted no, you know no. on uh, some big grand thing of I find poachers so interesting no but no I suppose it does have a link to kind of modern day but because I live in a re- really rural area and we still have poaching now of issues yeah. so um it is something that goes through time. I don't know if it'll ever be eradicated, really. Because we hear about things where land has been trespassed on by poachers. So it's probably not in the same way for feeding their family. It's probably more for profit or sport, yeah. unfortunately, these days. But, um, yeah, it is something you can link up to the modern day. Yeah, I suppose when you do think back and you think along the lines of, oh, they've done it to feed their family, it can kind of sympathise mm. yeah, to an extent much. with them. Yeah. But when it is just, oh, it's because I want money, it's, you mm. kind of just go... Really? Yeah. Why? <laughs> I think that's the thing when I was going through it, you can sort of sympathise more with the ones that were non violent mm. and would perhaps just set snares or go and uh, take a few rabbits um, because it was needed. Yeah. They would starve if they didn't. Yeah. And then you read about the ones that were taking, you know, several carcasses of deer. And you're like, you're selling that. <laughs> we know what you're doing. <laughs> Not stupid. But yeah, I, I think that's ironic in the ballads that a lot of the ones are the violent ones that are romanticised. And I really couldn't quite, you know, sort of work out why on that one, even through reading it. I suppose it's because it's that 
dashing man with a gun going up against like the figure of the gamekeeper that yeah. they might meet. It's kind of it's dangerous. It's exciting. They could be shot because gamekeepers were armed. Yeah. So there's that fear um, factor. I suppose that's why why they would you wouldn't I guess if you came up it was actually you they were coming up against or your family yeah but yeah m- most of it was, was around the more sadly the more violent gangs that came in for large scale poaching yeah unfortunately it's the same with a lot of stories though people do like like you said the drama the mm. excitement this danger and stuff if you tell them a lovely little story going oh well you were just trying to look out for people it was all lovely yeah. and stuff. aside from Robin Hood who is really romanticised <laughs> no one else can pull that off no <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> and she looked at you, Claude de Bell's. Like, oh, well, at least he was nice enough to dance with the women he robbed. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other than that, yeah. But yeah. no, uh, yeah, you, you, you would not want to come up against these poaching gangs, but for some reason they are romanticised in the ballads. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's unfortunately the way with stories in general. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so, what is it about this like criminal world that intrigues you? So I know that we're talking about poaching, you briefly touched about doing highwaymen in your uh, underground. Mm. Um, so, what is, what is it about the criminal? side that's kind of I think it's because the 18th century kind of a criminal system was so brutal that it kind of I don't know what that says about me but it attracted me um, yeah I think it was just that idea of how they judged crimes really mm. and I think I've been influenced uh, a little by where I've worked yeah. the years that a lot of it has dealt with crime and punishment mm. so when I settled on the 18th century which was really just because I had a very good lecturer at that period and it sort of sparked my interest and I thought well crime is logical you know I've always been interested in it I've worked in places courthouses <laughs> prison and uh, police museums and things like that and obviously now um, still working uh, in areas of like the, the justice system has, has come into play so yeah yeah I think it's always just been very much part of my life I'm not saying I'm a criminal on that. <laughs> can I just clarify but it's been sort of a sideline of, of my life so it seemed just logical to stick with crime you know to write about in more depth when you're presented with the 18th century when you're um, studying it and you can do any aspect of it because it was a more in- interdisciplinary degree um, you really have to decide quickly I think <laughs> what area you're going to focus on and you just get overwhelmed yeah. Yeah. and is that something you want to like pursue further like are you wanting to do, get like a PhD in this mm. because he was like a crime expert or yeah. something that, that would be great and it was my plan a few years ago but as of the moment no but you never know maybe in the 10 year plan perhaps yeah. Yeah. yeah and it would definitely be a long crime and punishment that it would be on yes yeah. that'd be cool to see you on TV yeah. like so this is a crime expert <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I will just stick to, you know, boring the customers at my current job, you know, yeah. with a lot of details on crime. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they come in and they love that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, Anything that's gory, I find, you know, people will listen. <laughs> so, what, what are your, like, now this is not really on the same subject as such, mm. but what are your thoughts on, like, the Dungeons Museum sort of thing? So that's all the darker side of history. Yeah, I think they have their place, certainly. I think the ones that, um, again, it's another form of romanticising it, isn't it? I suppose. Because you go to be thrilled. And uh, true, you, yeah. They're often dressed, okay, the criminals are quite handsome, <laughs> they're, you know, <laughs> luring kind of people in. If we're just talking about our kind of, my city, you know, like the, the little dungeon things, it's like Dick Turpin um, is very much sort of like the, he is a big attraction um, yeah. on that one, even though he was, you know, a horrendous criminal. Um, a lot of people come to, like, current place of work because they've heard about him and he was, you know, in prison there. And I think it is just that lure of the celebrity criminal, you know, which is a big one, um, especially with high women. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's... Uh I think they have a place to criticise it, but I think it's good that there are places that deal more in fact <laughs> on this, because you could take even, you know, kind of your literature and things you can find them. Um, obviously, poachers have gone through, um, maybe even later than the 18th century, um, through it as the, the romantic ones. And, uh, yeah, I think there's just that lure, no matter what time, sort of era that you're talking. So I think... If it's going to be so heavily romanticised, especially like with like your dungeons or other ones, I think it's good that some places stick to the facts as well. Yeah. You know, for whatever you're really wanting. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Is there any particular ballads that really like stuck with you that you might want to share or anything? Yeah, the ballads. I think there was one, um, it's called The Bold Poacher. Uh, I think that one was... Um, have had an impact purely because it hits you right in the face on the title on that one, The Bold Poacher, that shows someone who um, 
Kennedy's maybe come up against uh, something like barriers, got through. He was acted bravely and with courage. Ah, so we're not bold as in like no hair. Oh no, B O L D, <laughs> bold. <laughs> yeah. Let me say, if you're any of your listeners do want to go and see the broadside uh, ballads that are on the Broadway and online, there are some very very interesting images that go along with some of them. Want to try and describe any of them? Oh yeah, there's one that I couldn't even actually work out if it was supposed to be a man or a deer or a dog or anything. So um, yeah, you can go and have a look at that one if you just uh, you literally. It's very easy on there. Just pop poacher in under your time frame, yeah, and you'll be able to find them. But aside from that, very very weird one that I had to ask my supervisor what on earth was going on. Uh, most are just pictured kind of like maybe with a kill at their feet, their dog next to them, their gun aloft, yeah. you know, looking a very proud warrior like stance. Like it's it looks militaristic and like a soldier, which again uh, marries up to this whole brave heroic kind of thing. So yeah, the woodcuts that go with them with the ballads are, are quite interesting in themselves to be honest so as I can't show you um, sort of on a podcast but you can go and have a look <laughs> yourself and um, you'll see that the images do really play into that romantic image as well so, but yeah the, the bold poacher I think it is um, the ones where it just hit you and it, you know exactly what it's going to be like it's going to be romantic probably not based too much in reality of what yeah. a poacher was and that's another um, side of, of poaching as well, that if people were going out with dogs um, on stairs and things, chances are um, yeah, there were a different type of poacher to ones that had you know, guns and things. So there is um, the differentiation between the, the poorer and, and the richer ones on that that are doing it for profit. So it's quite oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. How, how exactly is the difference? So the poorer ones will just use dogs? If you're or? out with snares and things, you know, chances are you're just doing it to catch rabbits and okay. things like that. If you're actually going out hunting, you know, with, um, with your guns and things, you've obviously got enough money to afford the guns. It's a business, yeah, you yeah. know. Um, you're going after probably bigger game. Um, sort of in the... The game laws, which they're a little bit sort of uh, tedious, so we won't get too far into that. But um, there were a lot of laws written about it, so you can see how prolific poaching was, mm. and how um, often the game laws um, kind of featured in the press, so you know exactly what you can and can't do. <laughs> Though you do have to sympathise sometimes when land was enclosed. But suddenly they've lost a food, you know, a food yeah. source. But if it's going to be enclosed, then I think more sympathy can be, uh, in the modern sense, kind of from us looking onto it, more sympathy uh, goes towards those people that suddenly the landowners come in and enclose the land. Mm. And you see after that a lot more adverts for gamekeepers in the press at the time. Um, again, you can access the, the newspapers, either on microfilm or some are... Um, put online such as like York Explore for example you can get a lot of newspapers there and you'll see a rise in gamekeepers wanted so you, you can you can just see it. it's like land enclosure protect land and poaching goes up you know because what was once legal isn't you know that is removing the ones that are going after like deer and things but your rabbits and other things yeah you can really see a correlation it runs through um, about yeah sort of just what's going on in the country, yeah. you know, <laughs> poverty and things. It's yeah, sad state of affairs, but it's it's interesting to follow yeah. it through. So, how did it make you feel when you were actually? Sorry to sound like a therapist. How does it make you <laughs> feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, but the, how did it make you feel actually reading these stories mm. of people who you, you could sense were doing this purpose of, just for survival? Mm. Um, did it? How did that make you feel? Anything? Did it like? Yeah, I did feel a lot of sympathy when you're reading the court records of what happened to them, and you think, oh, what would happen to their family? You know, yeah. they were probably the ones that were were the breadwinners and just. <laughs> like not earning enough or it was too harsh a kind of winter or something for them and they had to do it and you think I want to know more because it just it sort of just stops there they're yeah. like such and such got this sentence or this happened and you're like well no I need to know more <laughs> what happened to his wife what happened to his children you know tell me please um, but yeah so that that was with sympathy but with reading kind of the um, sort of the ballads and things that was more just a I think you could be kind of a little amused by them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, they're funny in some of them because you're like, oh, yeah, you're telling this heroic tale, but these are just violent gangs that are going out onto land, probably killing gamekeepers <laughs> and, um, and, and, and selling on their wares, you know, at the, um, at the game fairs. Mm. So, um, yeah, it was a very... 
Yeah, it, very split, I think, uh, when, especially when you read it. If there was, like, in the court document she saw the gangs, you'd be like, yeah, very little sympathy for you. You deserve what's, what's coming to you, really, especially when it's like, oh, shot the gamekeeper and stuff yeah. like that. Um, you start to think, well, they're only doing their job, you know, and if you were going after big ones. Others, you like, was found with snares and other things you like. Really, you know that land was probably enclosed, and they, they had you were depriving them of their food source. So I had a lot more sympathy for them. Yeah, I think that is the idea of the, the sympathetic poacher was a, a phrase that came up a lot when I was studying this. Um, it's like, can they be a sympathetic figure? And the answer is yes, they can be, because you feel for them. Yeah, um, especially if if land has been enclosed, but. Um, as for the gangs, not so much. So it is a, a real t- two pictures, really, of different people, all labelled under the same banner of poacher. And the courts didn't particularly distinguish between yeah. the two, which is unfortunate. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, from the little bits I do know about um, criminal history of the 18th, well, not even 18th century, just criminal history, mm. uh, the idea of people like just having to hit stones all the time and all that sort of yeah. idea... Um, you can see it's a very unsympathetic time for people very, like yes. um, not even in the 18th century I mean even earlier than that mm. it was just like you, you've done a crime regardless you know this is your punishment mm-hmm. which as horrible as this may sound sometimes I feel like we should still in a way have that yeah. I feel a lot of people nowadays who commit crimes literally just get a pat on the back and off they go exactly um, I know that sounds really bad <laughs> yeah. um, but sometimes it does sound very it's very like oh yeah I popped into jail and it was all great like it was a holiday camp nowadays yeah um, so don't get me wrong I don't like the old laws I especially don't like when it comes to executions I don't feel like executions actually do anything no um, I mean but, it yeah. actually showed just uh, slightly away from poaching and things it showed it backfired on them because people there was not a massive appetite to execute for lesser crimes and it's Started to harm the victim. Yeah. So, such as a crime was a theft. Um, if it was over a certain amount, yeah. you would could be executed under that amount. You wouldn't. But then, people were. Well, it was going to court, and um, essentially, it was like, oh no, it was less than that amount. So it's like, well, actually, it wasn't. So there's no recompense or debt like paid back to the victim. But it was just because they were like, we cannot like execute. So there was kind of a, a period of time where it actually sort of backfired on them because there was no appetite to mm. like hang. Um, sort of petty criminals uh, that were just stealing a second farm or something. So, um, yeah, I think it, it showed that even the people handing down the, the sentences and the justice system, um, even they realised that it was a little bit barbaric on that, so they would try and make the crime seem smaller, but obviously then that harms the victim. If it could have just been a, a full sentence and debt paid and be honest how much they owed and they could go in as debtors yeah. then and pay back or be properly punished but without the execution it probably would have helped the victim more but yeah. that's a whole other argument you know for a different day but yeah <laughs> when it showed what you could actually be hanged for it was, it was quite insane you know yeah. <laughs> what was it the, the bloody code they called it you know yeah. so it's like um, there was a, a lot of uh, yes, just get rid of them, criminals, one way or another. Yeah, or even the smallest things. And it, in my opinion, it starts to rather diminish, like murder and treason. If somebody who's just stolen a few shillings or something yeah. is getting the same sentence as a murderer, what does that say yeah. about the system? So I'm glad it was overhauled. You know, in a way. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because I, I noticed it, like, the first time I ever went to one of the dungeons, because I have gone to the dungeons attractions, yeah. I went to the one in London, and they had, like, literally a list mm. of the things that you would be executed by. Yeah. It was just <laughs> random things like, oh, stealing a loaf of bread. <laughs> yes. You're dead. It's just like, yeah. what? what? <laughs> exactly. Sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. A, a very... Uh, yeah, uncompassionate system. <laughs> it was just, you know, no matter what, it, they can hang you for it. And um, I think that that does. It's not only shows the country is quite brutal, yeah, and it's like the code, but also I think it does diminish the higher crimes of like murder and treason if you can get hanged for something so petty. It's like, you know, you may as well go and commit a larger crime. Yeah, you know, you know that neighbour that's pissing you off. Might as well just off them. Might as well kill them rather than rob them. <laughs> <laughs> Get hanged anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, yeah, we're pushing it down to the bare bones a bit of the system there, but you know, it didn't always happen. People weren't always hanged, but no. when you knew you could be, yeah, 
it's, yeah. you know. So uh, what other areas of uh, your dissertation were you writing in? So you said you did a whole section about laws and you were like, the boring. Sort of <laughs> yeah. Sorry if my supervisor's listening to this. I did not think it was boring at all. No, it was very thrilling. It was very thrilling. 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 Yes, I loved sort of going through reams and reams of microfilm <laughs> <laughs> to find one court case. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but what, what other chapters uh, did you write about in your, your, uh, your dissertation? Yeah, I mean, the ballads did take up one whole um, sort of chapter because there was just so much um, to write about. Yeah, but yeah. Um, other representation uh, came through. I did look at, because it was an interdisciplinary degree, I could have looked at literature and yeah. things, but because it just seemed to, that would go a bit down the rabbit hole <laughs> that I wouldn't be able to get out of. So <laughs> I did kind of... to be a certain amount of number letters. Yeah, know? exactly. When it's 10,000 letters, I'm like, what I have, <laughs> you know, this amount. <laughs> Uh, it was just, it decided that, because my background's history, yeah. so I thought to get into the literature beyond ballads uh, was not going to be something that would really be particularly fruitful. So uh, that was quickly sort of dismissed um, as other things. Um, yeah, really, it was, it did focus on a lot on uh, kind of the law, and then it was representation. I am uh, drawing up completely on what my actual title was, but it was something like the representation and practices of poaching. That was it, yes, my middle chapter practicing. was practices of, of poaching. Um, and that's where we discussed, as I briefly mentioned a few minutes ago, about how people were doing this um was it dogs was it snares was it guns you know um because once you could get into the how you could probably find motive in there so and that's really the only way you were going to find what their motive was by by how they were doing it and what they were poaching yeah so so yes yeah, so the law the um how basically did it and uh, representation yeah so and the representation chapter was was focusing on these um, ballads the broadside ballads and the modelling but uh, it, it did touch upon slightly on other things of just how people saw them really so yeah <laughs> oh brilliant um, is there anything else you want to say about this topic <laughs> in question yeah, um, I think it's just one of those things that um, it can alter kind of area to area. My focus was very much Yorkshire. Okay. Um, I did look at a few because, again, you can very much kind of get down a rabbit hole with it of looking at artworks and other things that I did uh, put a nod to the fact that some have, uh, like, poachers have been depicted um, in artworks. Again, a lot of the time quite romanticised. It's a rather, obviously a rather beautiful scene that they are portrayed in and a lot are held in art galleries. Um, I was mostly on Britain, but a lot were held in Ireland as well. But obviously just as additional, you know, research, I just had a look at them to see how, how it was. So um, you can find a lot of, of the images online um, of the art in the art world that will show poachers and that's a really good way of looking for representation yeah how are they shown how is the artist um sort of portraying them are they front and center are they is it seen as a very delicate soft scene which most were or is it kind of a you know very sort of a brutal one which it, it just wasn't in in my um sort of research Others, if they looked into it, especially around the world, perhaps would find different things. But yeah. my focus was was on Britain and more detail into Yorkshire. So, on representation, you will find um, a lot of the heroic side, the noble, the militaristic comparisons, which is is interesting. But I would encourage if you're going to go into it, do do have a look at the reality as well, because you'll find a lot about the social situation of, of Britain, how it was going, um, what was going on on, land, on the land uh, that people had been uh, sort of free to look at, uh, look at, what the hell, free to uh, kind of hunt on, yeah. um, and things, and suddenly they can't, and you can really tell a lot, I think, from poaching in the court records, you can see a lot about just what was going on in the country at the time, yeah. you know, so you'd think, oh, it's just a yeah, very sort of niche crime, Actually, it's not. You know, you can actually tell an awful lot about the social kind of unrest and everything yeah. from that. So, yeah. <laughs> so you kept on touching on the fact that you can learn about what was happening in the ta uh, in the country at the time. Mm. Yeah, um, this is 18th century again, just to remind everybody. Yes, uh, this is the 18th century. Um, was there anything of like showing a difference of like? Especially as you said, it was Yorkshire you were focused on, mm. and as we we know, even to this day, there is the North and South divide. Yeah. Um, is there any? Was there any kind of distinct distinction between, like, say, people perching down near London area compared to um, up here, sort of thing? 
Because I was so focused on uh, on Yorkshire, I can't. I wouldn't claim to be any kind of expert on showing right. um, the difference between the two. What I'd probably say is some of the things I found when I'd uh, put in kind of when you just start a topic and you just put like famous poachers or yeah, something yeah. like that, I would kind of find that in some down south uh, they were more named. It okay. was more um, the actual uh, perhaps more about the actual people, and um, there was that real. A sort of story about them, really, more of a person rather than just the, the crime. <laughs> you know, yeah. whereas yes, could I find the crimes? In, uh, the uh, sorry, the people. Sorry, when I was looking at the court documents, yes, because it's listed who they are. But did they get any notoriety? No, <laughs> not really. Whereas, um, yeah, on downside were a couple. Uh, I'm sorry, the names escaped me because it wasn't. It was only briefly looked at. So I was like, mm, I'd love to write about you, <laughs> but you're in the wrong area. Yeah. Um, but it was like, oh, they're actually kind of named, and it's like the such and such the noted poacher I think it was something Bedford perhaps like the noted poacher I'm like oh that's interesting you know they're actually talking about a particular person rather than just these are the crimes and we're going to sort of talk about them so yeah say about that um, I suppose in your sort of inner cities it would be um, a case of that's where it the poacher would come into contact with them of trying to fence the the, the items because yeah. they're the highwaymen really you know do it out on the, in the country attack carriages yeah, yeah. Uh, poachers are out in the fields or on the farmers lands the big estates then it comes into contact um so in the big cities when they're actually trying to sell those goods on oh, yeah. you have to get the criminals so yeah I suppose I'd say I can't really talk too much about the north side of on that but I do think the rural urban divide yeah. is something that obviously poaching is a largely rural crime but it clashes it, it buffers right up against the urban when you have to go and sell it yeah. you know at these big game fairs and things they'd be in the cities often or the towns yeah. so that's where it can uh, get interesting you know hmm. um, we're obviously talking about the poachers there that are poaching for profit <laughs> rather than than just eating what they've got. So, um, yeah, I'd say, yeah, I was more struck by the, the rural urban thing over the, the north-south. But that's something that, which should I have gone on further, could have been looked at. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think this is something you might consider looking into later on down the line, maybe decide to write your own book on this or something? <laughs> I don't know, future plans. <laughs> right now, no. But, yeah, like I say, if I were to as you'd sort of ask about, like, PhD or looking at it in any way, um, I would stick with crime, whether it would be poaching in particular, I couldn't say, because I say I had to sort of stumble onto poaching yeah. because of um, circumstance. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was certainly really interesting, and I like the ballads, uh, reading ballads both for highway robbery, uh, which there are a lot more of them, <laughs> and, um, and poaching. So, yes, I, w- I wouldn't rule it out, certainly, <laughs> you know, if I were to go on study, all right, yeah. Or maybe keep an eye out. There might be some books by her or more papers by her. You never know. You never know. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you for this, Alan. This has been actually very, very interesting. Yeah, thank you. Um, because it's, just, it's an area of history that I don't know much about. My background's mostly in archaeology. Yeah. Um, so I cover um, the sort of stuff I tend to do. I mean, I cover all areas of history, not men mm. but I, I'm interested in kind of dots about all over the place. Yeah. And this is precisely why I wanted to talk to you and other people just like mm. you, covering different topics and stuff, because it's just fascinating. There's yeah. so many different areas of history that we, we don't know about. Like, mm. it, if I was, to, like, most people that I would talk to, obviously, would instantly jump to Vikings or instantly jump to the Tudors or something like that. But mm. the fact that you've gone and decided to focus not, on, not just on the 18th century, because some people would focus on the 18th century and probably focus on, like, maybe Queen Victoria coming onto mm. the throne and everything. But the fact that you've gone not just 18th century, but I'm focused on crime. And not just crime, but poetry. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's I think that's the thing. I think the 18th century is, is fascinating for that because it's so much going on. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, with the, from the monarchy to, I know people that have done like even things like material culture and the parliament. Um, some of my friends did, or um, court gossip. Um, oh, some of my friends did, or uh, kind of poetry, pocketbooks, things like that. There's so much going on that can be talked about, and it, it's, it's hard sometimes to pick a particular thing. So I was quite lucky that I went in thinking it will be crime. I just <laughs> have not decided up until the station what exactly it would be. It's going to be crime, one way It's going to be crime, definitely crime. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so um, there was so much going on, and it was such a, a period of change, I guess, really. And yeah. had it been like long 18th century, is uh, what we're allowed to study. Um, so, so much change did happen in that time. So yeah. it's even not just narrowing it down to um, 
something that was occurring, like I say, with me, with the, with crime, but also, you know, trying to get it down in years as well. Yeah. <laughs> you know? you, you can't do 200 of... years. No, there was a, definitely a big... Ma- I mean, in the time of Queen Victoria's reign anyway, there was a massive change in, like, people's attitudes to things. There was change in equipment and, like, industrial stuff. Just yeah. literally like, everything changed. That's, that's why, yeah, obviously that was big um, when we come out of the, the 18th century period into Victorian. Um, it's sort of... It was. Everything seemed to move so fast. Yeah. But people can sometimes forget the 18th century in yeah. a way because obviously there wasn't. Um, well, yeah, the, the speed of change I guess that, that happened in, in Victorian times. But, um, but yeah, I think the 18th century still. If you consider the wars, um, the monarchs on the one throne, um, just really what was going on in Britain so was that that changed. Um, I think yeah, it's it's an interesting time. Um, even if you're you're more towards like fashion or anything really you can you can find something of interest I think in the 18th century yeah, yeah. <laughs> another question I've just I've just had a thought is um, yeah. when you were looking at these people that were being purchased and stuff are they officially um, was there any evidence to suggest that they may have come from other countries or anything like that or were they just purely Yorkshire rural individuals um, just, yeah yeah you know. um, I didn't see any uh, that I could use um, in it, so if it was sort of quite um, moved past, really, if it was anyone that was sort of abroad. Um, there were suggestions of gangs coming from cities, so it wasn't always just, you know, sort of a rural <laughs> guy. Well, it could have been ones from uh, from cities. So, again, that rural urban as opposed to geographic kind of thing. Um, yeah, not really... Island featured, but obviously that is it would be very close at that time, yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but I had to kind of uh, narrow it down, up, obviously, um, to a bit of a small geographic area, or I'd have yeah, got a yeah. bit too, <laughs> yeah, and I got a bit out of control. But um, as for actual foreign, I mean, I've looked at um, in one of my modules that was a taught one because my master's was taught um, of kind of foreign um, sort of criminals and other ones that um, operated uh, abroad. And so I wouldn't say my interest is solely in uh, sort of Britain, but that one had yeah. to be uh, just narrowed down, yeah. really. But others, it was... Uh, but other modules, yeah, are very much looking at kind of criminals abroad and ones that are also a bit stateless, like piracy and things like yeah. that. So it wasn't just just that. When I was actually doing the taught part of my... I took a, tended to veer towards, unsurprisingly, I had the modules on, on crime. Yeah. And so, yeah, I think... Um, it wasn't just just British crime. I mean, I looked at kind of even down to the mafia and things like that yeah. in one an organised crime, and so that obviously had a very um, international element. But, that's, that's really cool. but as for my actual like uh, dissertation and what I was obviously talking about today, it was very much kind of Britain and then more focused on Yorkshire. Yeah. So, yeah. And then, like you said before previously, that you didn't know these people individually, or at least they might be the odd case when you might know about mm. the individual person. And I was just wondering if there was any evidence uh, suggesting that it could have been people of any kind of background yeah. who have like, travelled over and they found themselves in crappy situations so mm. they kind of had to do this to survive. Because yeah. um, obviously Britain has been a, a place where we've, we've just had people from all over the place since like oh, the from, yeah, the Romans, really. Yeah, <laughs> they yeah. <started> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we get down of what does it mean to be British? <laughs> Uh, on this one, and we start a new one, but no, it's uh, yeah, I like to say it's not something I personally sort of looked at, but yeah. you know, so it's quite possible. possible. Go and have a look, to. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yeah, if you want to go into further things on this, do go and have a look at that, but yeah, well, brilliant. Well, okay. thank you for this, thank no you. Worries. This has been very, very interesting. Yeah, um, sorry, I kept on bombarding you with questions. And oh, not like at all. I was happy, um, you know, to talk about 18th century crime, <laughs> and it's been very fascinating. I've, found, I've really enjoyed this, so yeah. thank you for your time. No worries. Thank you. Our uh, coffee's have gone cold. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, hopefully, maybe you'll come back on Higgs podcast, maybe? maybe? Yes, absolutely. Cover something else, maybe? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, <laughs> so my background's history, I've covered a lot of modules. So, you know, I'll be like, yeah, I'm just going to talk about such and such this time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I'm sure I'd always bring it back to crime, though. You know me. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will say goodbye then. Thank yeah, you. Goodbye. So Thank, you. Right, Thank you. Bye bye.